Aloha and welcome everyone. We have arrived at our <coughs> sixth and final workshop of the Ashtanga Yoga Bali Conference featuring Annie Pace. So present Annie Pace. So I wasn't quite sure if it was a blessing or a curse to be like very last, right? But it's a blessing, of course. And I realize it really is because look at this amazing group of people and everyone has been practicing so diligently, respectfully, and beautifully for the last six days. Um, it's a lot, and it's a lot of good energy. So thank you all for, you know, you, it's, it's y'all who are doing it, yeah? We're, we're standing up here giving our opinions and our two cents and our stories, but it's, it's kind of your story. And it, it felt last night we were talking um, in the conference that it's kind of like, for me, it feels like a family reunion, right? From kind of the elders in the tribe. And also a celebration or almost like a coming of age ceremony for the next generation. And how cool is that? I, I'm just so grateful to be part of this. So, so here we are. And is anyone tired or are you wired? How's everyone? Good? I'm kind of tired wired, <laughs> right? It's kind of both because it goes in these waves through the course of a week where, oh, it's real high energy and everybody's into it. And then, oh my God, this is a lot. And oh, I need, and then it goes up again. And so it goes like this. So here we are. And what we we're going to do today, I thought, was spend the first part of this time um, me talking about theory, concepts, behind the practice, kind of the big picture of what happens in yoga. And then perhaps in the second part, entertain a few questions pertaining to that. And then the very last part, we'll put down our mats and actually do a little practice. Right, so what did I call this? This is supposed to be embracing the obstacles. Okay, so some obstacles inevitably are there. So we'll get around in the last part as far as techniques and how to actually work with special circumstances. Um, but first, I'd like to take a big step back to look at the macro, kind of the big picture of what it is we're doing. We all are figuring out what we do on our mat and how to put our bodies and how to do the poses and we work with the breath and we work in our little bubble of practice. But what happens when we practice and what are we really made of and how does that relate to nature and everything around us? So the biggest umbrella of existence, of form, of gross matter of anything that exists and has form, that big umbrella of energy, okay, falls into these three categories of quality called gunas. You all know that word? Who knows that word? Oh, not, not very, it's a cute little word, right? We got a lot of cute little words going on. Yoga, guna, two syllable words. It's not too complicated. Right, but it's what we're made of. So Prem talked the other day about our constitution and how we're all made of the five elements, right? This is a bigger umbrella than that. Even the elements are made of these three ingredients. So you could call the gunas the three ingredients of existence, right? And they do not work independently there are always three in the recipe. One cannot stand alone, right? Always some combination of the three. So you might have something, some one, some form that is 99% of one of these ingredients, but there's always a few percentages or a little bit of the other two. And these three energies are what play in our system, what play in nature, what play all around us that cause us to act in certain ways, to think in certain ways, 
to give our mind certain qualities. Okay, y'all with me? Yes? So does anyone know what they are, the three? Rajas, Tamas, Sattva. Okay. And if we were to list them in a very traditional order, we would start with Tamas. All right. So the Tamas, Tamasic in its adjective form, Tamasic energy. All right. What is that? Prem referred to that a little bit the other day, but he didn't expound on what it was. And I was wondering, God, I wonder if these people know <laughs> what he's saying <coughs> because he used some of these words. So this tamasic energy is the energy that moves downward. It's the energy of darkness. It's the energy of sleep. It's the energy of the warrior and the warrioress. Okay? It can be the destroying energy, as in Shiva and Durga and Kali, the destruction that leads to transformation. Right? I like to say it's the energy of making space, of getting rid of what is not serving us. It's definitely the energy of Kali, Durga, Durga. Um, some of these images are up here and they're not arbitrary, right? There's a reason behind these images and what they represent. One of them is a photo of the deity that is installed at Shakti Sharanam. Um, in Christone at Maishala, right, where we do puja every day and we honor that energy. This particular one is Chamundeshwari, and she is sort of like the patron saint of Mysore. <laughs> she overlooks the city and is the protectress, right? So often you'll see these images armed with spears and daggers and bows and weapons. And you walk into a temple or a yoga shala and you think, that's not very yogic. What about ahimsa? What about nonviolence and the eight limbs and all of that? Right? So that can lead into a very interesting discussion in itself about what is ahimsa. But without this tamasic energy, we would not be able to sleep at night. Right? Shiva, god of darkness. Darkness, black color, covering. We need that time when appropriate. Right? Daytime sleeping, not so good. Right? So appropriateness in how these energies play um, is a very interesting thing to watch. Right? So the tamasic energy of downward movement, making space, it's the energy where I'm going to clean out this closet. I'm going like, to get rid of all this stuff I don't need anymore. It's the taking stuff to the Salvation Army or the free box. It's making space. It's making space in our life perhaps eliminating relationships, associations, um, eliminating activities that aren't serving us. Are you with me? Yes? OK. So darkness, color is black, downward moving. Right? In the realm of the gods and the deities, this applies to Shiva, Bhairav, Kali, Durga, Chamundeshwari. Many, many different forms are there. So even the aspects of the divine are under the influence and made of these qualities, these gunas. In the food world, right, tamasic, what do you think are tamasic foods? Things that bring us down, right? Downer kind of foods, alcohol, meat, pot, too much excess downward movement, inertia, something that people don't pay attention too much to in the Western world. And it probably doesn't happen so much in tropical climates because you have so much fresh food available to you. But this whole idea in America of leftover food, <laughs> like you cook something and it's really pure in its nature and it's all organic and you've cooked it with love and all this stuff happens. And you cook it and you serve it and then you put it in the refrigerator Right? And you take it out and you serve it again or you heat it up. It is completely changed in its quality. And what happens is this tamasic energy gets into that food or whatever it is that we're consuming and can be a real downer kind of energy. Yeah. So what else? Um, 
foods, gods, qualities. Questions about tamas? Okay, downward. So it's this. Right? So first, and again, the, the order in which we're listing these, and this is the order in which all of this is honored in a festival called Navaratri, where there are three, it's a nine day festival, three days associated with each, each of these three gunas. So the first three days are all about Durga. They call it Durga festival, right? Celebrating that warrior us and getting into that mode of making space. Once we have made space, all right, and we fill it up with something good, which guna would that be? Sattva, okay, the energy that moves up. So this sattvic energy is that of pureness, of lightness, the color is white, pure and good things, abundance, right, upward moving. It's the energy that's in our system when we have one of those aha moments, right? We're not, when we're having an aha moment, we're not going like this, oh, aha. It's like, yeah, aha, Jay, all right? That thing that we can glimpse every once in a while, and then maybe more glimpses come. So this energy, lightness, upward moving in the gods and goddesses, this is represented by Lakshmi and Vishnu. You know, Vishnu, the preserver. Lakshmi, the goddess of abundance, happiness, wealth, all things good. Um, in the food world, what would be sattvic food? Obviously, fresh, organic fruits and vegetables, these things that are going to work in our system to be easily digested and cultivate that energy in our system as well. Right? So the sattva energy is the most desirable for a yogi. Without that sattvic energy in our system, there's very little chance of chitta vritti nirodha. Okay? If too much tamasic rajasic energy going on, there is no way that the mind is going to be still. So if we can tip the scale or just be aware of how these energies are at play, or, or when it, God, what came over me? <laughs> you know, there's a story <coughs> about Lakshmi and Vishnu, right? Lakshmi and Vishnu, they're supposed to be sattvic. Right? The sattvic gods of good purity, you know, nonviolence, all that good stuff. Where Lakshmi curses Vishnu, so his head falls off. <coughs> I'm like, what's up with that, Miss Sattvic Lakshmi? <laughs> right? And that's where this play comes in, right? Where Lakshmi is temporarily overtaken by this tamasic guna. So that something could happen and Vishnu could lose his head and then something else could happen and then his head could get re replaced by a different head so that he could slay this demon who was re wreaking havoc in all the three worlds. And eventually it rolls around in this car the story inside of story inside of story that, oh, I get it why that happened. Right? So even if it's 1%, it might be an appropriate time for that to come up so that something can play itself out in this karmic wheel. Making sense? Okay. Um, so, sattva, upward movement, light energy, very desirable, right? But not exclusive. If we were all sattvic, we couldn't sleep at night. Okay. So then, the third one would be rajas. Okay, the rajasic energy, and that's the energy of action. It's the energy of Brahma and Saraswati. Brahma, the creator. Saraswati, the goddess of music, of education, of learning, of energy that moves this way. It's a little bit more fiery and its color is red. Yeah, this is what this activity we're doing right now. This is a rajasic activity. I'm not sitting in meditation in my cave. I'm here talking with y'all, having this energy moving this way. Okay, music and the arts are not meant to be in isolation in the cave. <laughs> they are meant to be shared. So it's a sharing, it's an interaction, it dances this way. Um, in the food world, rajasic foods would be things that are fiery, right? Things in the upper category, like coffee, <laughs> right? That things that are stimulating, which when appropriately used, 
fine, no problem. But in excess, an imbalance happens. So we have these three energies, and the way that I make sense of it in order is first, make space. Make space. You know, how can you fit anything even into your life? You ever notice how sometimes in your life, until it's like something happens and something leaves, you end a relationship or you a job or a house or something like that, you let go of something, something is gone, and all of a sudden there's space for something else to come in. So we make space, and then the space is filled up by something that is good and pure and helpful, and then we take it out into the world. Yeah. And it seems that the way most of Western culture operates is ass backwards. <laughs> that everyone is out there taking it into the world before they've done their work, right? Before we've made space, before we've recognized something good, before some intelligence and actual wisdom comes in there, right? We love to get all this bookish knowledge, right? And we read and we read and we intellectualize and then, oh, I'm gonna preach this thing. But without having the experience in doing our work, sometimes it can be more damaging to bring it out into the world than not. So this is kind of the sequence of action. So these qualities appear, again, in the gods, in the goddesses, in, in materials, in the, everything is made of the three ingredients. Nothing is made of just one, right? These are also the qualities of mind. Right? And this is where the gunas link very directly with yoga, right? Yoga is citta vritti nirodha. Yoga is a cessation of fluctuations in the mind, yeah? That very clearly states that this yoga practice is indeed about the mind, yeah? Contrary to popular Western assumption, right, it's not so much about the body. Yeah, we're using the body because it's what we live in. It's our tool. We don't go out without it. It's very conveniently located right here, right? The sister science of Ayurveda is actually more directly linked to the body, right? In our constitution, our makeup of the elements, our doshas, right? How we are in our body, right? The mind is a little bit more linked to the gunas. So just something to keep in mind, but not get attached to, right? Um, the third sister science, or brother science, as Guruji always said, three brothers are there, yoga, Ayurveda, and Sanskrit. Right? So if we're practicing one of these, it's helpful to have a little bit of accompaniment from the other two. And if we're practicing consistently, inevitably those bits and pieces will come in. Whether we know the words about it or not, they will come in, right? The Sanskrit language is very powerful. We're fortunate to have Manju here, like doing it the right way. <laughs> um, it's good to at least learn the names of the poses. <laughs> little bits, little bits, little bits. It doesn't have to be huge. But the three go together. Guruji always said the three brothers. Three brothers are always there, right? Looking after us. So tamas, sattva, rajas. Okay. The three doshas are about the body, and the three gunas are about the mind. Yes. Yep. You got it. That that would be it. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go next chapter now, relating to this as well, about time. Another very cute two-syllable Sanskrit word called yuga. Do we know that word? Not yoga, but yuga. Who knows that word? Who am I, who am I speaking to? Okay, a few people know that word. <laughs> okay, so yuga is a measurement of time. Many time measurements are there. We have a day, we have a week, we have a 24-hour period, we have a season, we have the moon cycles, um, the cycles of the day, sunrise, sunset, you know, somehow they have been compartmentalized into calendars and all of this. And again, if we take one huge step back to the macro of big chunks of time, 
the biggest chunk of time, you could call it like an eon or an era, would be a yuga. Right? I have heard that a yuga is tens of thousands of years old. I've heard that it's hundreds of thousands of years old. I've heard many things about the yugas. There are four of them. Right? Does it really matter if it's 10,000 or 100,000 and 30,000 or 400,000? Probably not because it's a cyclical thing of time. Yeah? So in these eras of time, there are four. We right now are in the beginning part of the last yuga called Kali Yuga. In the beginning, the first yuga is called the Satya Yuga. We all know Satya? What is it? Truth. It was a time of truth. And this was the time when the three gunas were in balance in the universe. And the original Vedic truths and the eternal truths were established, they were known. It was a known thing. In the first yuga, there weren't workshops and classes and counseling and rehab, <laughs> right? <laughs> things, things were in balance, right? And the sattvic energy was not so hard to find, right? That lightness, that goodness, it was part of everything was balanced. There, they say that in this first yuga, it was like, having a pedestal or a cot with four legs to stand on, okay? You, ever, you look at a bar stool or a chair, how many legs does it have? Four. If you had a, a three-legged bar stool or chair, it's a little more wobbly, right? So in this first yuga, right, there's also four Vedas and there's lots of correlations that go along with this, but it was a time of, stu <coughs> excuse me, stability. Things were established. So as time goes on, the years roll by, be it hundreds of thousands of years or thousands of years or tens of thousands of years, whatever it is, the time goes by and things get a little out of balance and it's a little harder to find that sattvic pure energy. And they say this second yuga, Trita yuga, like having three legs to stand on, only three legs are there and things are a little bit wobbly. This is where some of the other scriptures started coming in and the teachings, okay? They say the Upanishads appeared in this second yuga, the Trita Yuga. This was also the time of one of the first stories. And, you know, is this true, what I'm saying? I don't know, I wasn't there, right? But I've heard from many sources, right? that in, when this time of imbalance started coming about, this is where the teachings started coming in the form of stories. And that this is where the ec epic Ramayana came in, right? So trouble was brewing. And if we know a little bit about the story of the Ramayana, okay, it's, it's this trouble brewing, right? We've got, you know, Rama and Sita over here in India in the forest, and we've got Ravana over there in Sri Lanka, and there's this big drama across the ocean, and the trouble is brewing, and Hanuman had to come in and save the day, and all that stuff happened. And it was kind of long distance, you know, Ravana had his stuff going on over here, right? So stories started coming in that talked about <coughs> or represented the play of these three gunas, and also the play of karma. Why? Why did Sita get captured, right? She's part of Lakshmi. What's up with that? Right? So the stories go on and the links are revealed. So then what happens? More time goes by. The years roll on. Some more tens or hundreds of thousands of years go by. It brings us to the Tvarpa Yuga. Two legs to stand on. Things are very wobbly. It's even harder to find any of that sattvic energy. This was the time where there started being ashrams and the families sent their sons out into the forest to get educated and there was more formal education going on to relearn these original truths that were starting to be lost. This is the time of Bhagavad Gita Mahabharata. You all know that story? Some yes, no. Okay. So the Bhagavad Gita story is Arjuna Right? Here's Arjuna on the battlefield being asked to fight his uncles and his cousins. And he's in this moral dilemma of, 
Do I fight? Do I not fight? What about Ahimsa? These are my blood relatives. There's a big moral dilemma going on. Right? And Krishna comes in and reveals the big picture, right? where perhaps the appropriate thing to do in that situation would be indeed to take action and fight. Right? And then the story goes on about karma yoga and everything that is told in the Bhagavad Gita. So in time and space, what I see happening in these stories, in these representations, is that, oh my God, this trouble brewing is not like across the ocean with some demon. It's within the own family bloodline, right? So the trouble and the imbalance starts coming closer and closer to home, right? And much more of a dilemma. Very stressful for Arjuna. What to do, right? These are difficult decisions to be made. So imbalance is there. More stories are told. This is the, the stories that come out in the Puranas. And there's a particular Purana that I've been studying intensely for many years called the Devi Bhagavatam. And in that book are all the stories of the gods and the goddesses and the wars and the demons and how these karmic wheels go. And this book is about this thick <laughs> in its English translation. And you have to read every bit at least 12 times to see the interconnectedness, right? And it takes a long time sometimes in the book to get the moral of this story over here because of all this karmic play. So this stuff starts being represented in literature, in stories that all has to do with the gunas, the time, the karma, the gross, the subtle, the dance of opposites. Right, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So, Dwarpa Yuga, trouble's brewing. Oh, Arjuna, what to do? Years go by some more. That brings us to the Kali Yuga, which here we are. Isn't it interesting that we all got born into the same time? <laughs> Even the fact that we're all together in this same room. Okay? Something happened to cause that. And you know, we were saying last night about it's always both. It's our karma and it's our current actions and the decisions that we make now, okay, that add up to our future experiences. So in this yuga, we're down to one leg, pretty wobbly, right? No wonder um, the world is as it is when we look around at the imbalance in nature, what's happening to Mother Earth, what's happening with humanity, how we are behaving on the planet, it's a tricky time to be here, right? And it also is the time of technology. We have all kinds of technology there. We had some discussions the other night about techno, right, and technique. It's the time of practicing technique and using technology appropriately, right? And when we get into this era of time, if you look at literature, you start seeing things like the Hatha Yoga Paripika, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, right? These texts are not hundreds of thousands of years old. They're maybe a few thousands of years old, okay? Pretty contemporary in the big picture of time. And these texts are not convoluted stories about the gods and goddesses. They are pretty darn succinct, right? Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, okay? Atta Yoga Nushasanam, and now yoga. Yoga is a cessation of fluctuations in the mind. It's a very systematic, short, concise way of explaining these theories. It doesn't go off there into the stories so much. So it gives us something that perhaps we can understand, hold on to, um, explore more deeply. So that's what happens in the world of literature, right? In the world, things are unbalanced, and we get to do extra credit practice right now right, to try to find that original balance. And when we get into the whole practice of yoga, again, it's not like we're trying to reach some extraordinary state or some superhuman capacity. Right? It's a remembering. It's a remembering our original state before all the layers of conditioning. And it is our birthright. It's not something special that is reserved for the saints and the sages and the yoga rock stars. 
This is human birthright, right? And that's what we all have in common. In spite of our differences, we are all indeed human beings. Homo sapiens, I believe, we're called. The species, we're of the same species. So what happens when we practice? What does happen when we practice? Why do we keep coming back, right? What's going on in our system, right? It's a difficult time to be in. We have got challenges in our life, challenges on the planet. Sometimes it's hard to get on the mat, right? Sometimes our practice really sucks and it's not any fun, but we come back the next day and we keep coming back and we keep coming back and we keep coming back. What happens is that very slowly, our system is being tamed so that we can welcome in and receive a little bit more of that sattvic energy, right? So if we're aware of some of these principles, it doesn't have to be a big dogmatic, follow these rules, don't eat garlic, don't drink coffee, do this, don't do that. But if we have a little bit of awareness, right, and we start to explore this, we might find, oh, a little something we could do here, and a little something we could do here, a little five minutes something we could build into our day, something to accompany our practice. Maybe we could take that oil bath once a week, right? To tip the scale just enough so that we start moving in the right direction and that all of our practices support each other, okay? And when that happens, it's like, yeah, it's kind of a cool ride, right? It's not so much of a, an uphill thing, right? If we can learn sort of the accompanying um, accessory practices. So we'll talk about that these accessory things, I think, in the second section after we, after we break. Okay, so what happens in the body? Sattvic energy comes in. Well, how does that happen? What goes on? What ties us together as human beings? All right. We don't all look the same. Okay? Some of us are missing limbs or organs or pieces and parts of our gross physicality. But what ties us together is, again, I'm going from gross to subtle, of the system, the energetic system of nadis. Another cute two-syllable word, nadi. Does anyone know how nadi translates? So there's translation, there's implication. Direct translation, okay, my understanding is nadi translates as river, river that would imply flowing, yeah? In the more contemporary texts from this yuga, they refer to 72,000 nadis in the human system. If you start reading some of the older texts in the Puranas, they refer to 350,000 nadis in the human system. In either case, whether it's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, it's like a boatload. Can you imagine? How can you imagine 350,000? You can't. We could imagine maybe what an acupuncture chart looks like in the meridians, right? That's a, a smaller number. And the nadis are very much like those meridians, but on the subtlest level that there is. They connect every bit of our being. So when we practice, right, slowly, okay, often not in our consciousness or our mental awareness, we're starting to clear out these energy channels. Right. So there is one of these nadis that is very, very, very important, and it is called Shushumna, <laughs> thank you, and it runs like the center axis from the base of the spine to the top of the head, just like an axis, right? There are two nadis surrounding that that are very, very important. Ida and Pingala, all right? So most of you know this, all right? So those three act like this core, right? So around that, if you do the math, there must be 349,997 other energy channels cruising around our system, little rivers running in our system. And at the ma major intersection points, 
where a lot of these other nadis cross Shushumna and Ida and Pingala, what do we get? Chakras. So you could say, right, in kind of simple English, that a chakra is a major nadi intersection point. Right? And so the chakras actually sit this way, right? not like you see on the t-shirts, right? like this. All right? Chakra means disc or wheel. Okay? Different. So there are seven primary intersection points. And it's kind of like a system of highways. So in Colorado, it's not like this in Bali. Bali is a small island. But in Colorado, we have a couple of major highways. Right? In California, they have that major highway that runs from the north to the south. In Colorado, we've got this highway that runs north and south. It's called I-25. Right? And in the middle of Colorado, in Denver, there's a highway that runs east and west. It's called I-70. And when those two meet, there's this fancy schmancy intersection that used to be called the mousetrap. And now I don't know what it is. It's some fancy flyover thing where you're going on the freeway and you're headed north and you want to go east. You do this little loop-de-loop -loop thing, and the next thing you know, you're going off to Kansas. Right? So that's a pretty cool thing. It's like this technology right, of transportation, of mobility, of getting from point A to point B. But what if you're traveling north on I-25 and you want to get to Kansas on I-70 and you get to this intersection point and it's rush hour, there's an accident, there's construction, and your car overheats. Right? It's not so cool. And what a sucky place to be stopped right? in the middle of chaos. So the way that these highways run can be a total blessing and totally cool things like, oh yeah, efficient, get from point A to point B. Or if something is blocked, if something breaks down, if something is not in balance, if a blizzard, flash blizzard comes in, you're not going to get anywhere. So the same thing happens in our body, right? This inner highways, if you will, which can be really cool if everything is open and flowing and no problem, you don't have to stop at a toll gate, nothing slows you down. But the chances of something happening at these major intersection points are actually higher <laughs> than if you're down in the San Luis Valley of Colorado and there's no intersections or anything. It's a, it's a pretty good bet you're going to be able to get from point A to point B in, in an allotted amount of time. But when these big intersections, like big airports, right? Simpler airports are smaller ones, right? So it can be um, a little bit challenging if something happens. Same thing, if we have some sort of blockage in our system, again, knowingly or unknowingly, we might not understand whether, why am I feeling this way? Why am I feeling this way? How cool, how cool is that? I don't know what's going on, but it feels good, right? So we don't need to know what's going on, and y'all don't need to know everything that I'm saying right now, but sometimes it's helpful to have that one or 2% theory to put things in a bigger package because we can get so, little self-absorbed in our bubble of practice and our human body and all the stuff that happens in our life. There's so much going on, right? We all have it. We're all human beings. We all have this system. So energetically, this is what happens. There's ebbs and there's flows and there's openings and there's closings, right? And again, the more we can do in our practices, a little bit here, a little bit there, to keep things flowing smoothly, the ride is a little bit smoother. So. There you go, nadis, chakras, yugas. When I start with gunas, they're all very short words, okay? Big meanings. So this micro macro thing has been fascinating to me. I will never ever get bored with this. And <clears throat> the whole idea of yoga, right, in its unity of oppos opposites is amazing. It never ceases to amaze me. So if we go on to then the chapter of yoga, what does that word mean? Union, okay, yuj, to join, to yoke, to unite, okay. Unite what? She says the mind, the body, the breath. The breath. People say body, mind, spirit, okay. So many things unite or have the capacity to be united okay we are born with that capacity right we are human beings and it is possible liberation is possible 
union is possible. So if we look at the macro union, ultimately the state of yoga is the union with God. Okay? Humanity and divinity come together. Right? That which is temporary, these little vessels we're walking around in, unite with something that is not limited by time or space, right? the eternal. So the temporary and the eternal come together, the micro and the macro, the gross and the subtle, the inner and the outer, and the right and the left and the down and the up, and all of that stuff that seem like apparently opposite qualities, okay? inner, outer, up, down, right, left, male, female. Okay? He's like, whoa, wouldn't that, you know, playing with, this is a lot of duality going on. So it's the practice that unites the dualities and actually allows these, the dance, if you will, of these opposite qualities, right, to play out and actually evolve into something that is so far beyond either one by itself. Okay? It's like you've got to go down to go up in the poses. You've got to have a foundation or you have no place from which to move, right? There's got to be this, this play a foundation and intention and action. So on the way to this big picture of samadhi, liberation, union with God, I call them little micro unions that happen very conveniently in our little package. You know, all of a sudden we realize, oh, if I do that with the ball in my foot, this happens. Or if I do that here, this happens. Or if I move this rib, or if I do that. And you guys have been really awesome guinea pigs all week because I've seen you have like four of us on you giving you different instructions. Do this, do that, see what happens, right? And it's up to us as practitioners to, uh, to take that in, take in the experience, not just the instructions, but what did it feel like when, okay? Darby was telling me this and Prem was telling me this and Annie was telling me this and you got all these different instructions going on. Okay, do this, do that. But then at the end of the day, what did that feel like? Okay. And if it felt good, if it was the ka-chunk, the aha, right, plug that memory in of the experience. Okay. Not just the instructions or the verbiage from the teacher, the experience. And this, I think, is, is so beautiful to, to have all of us together here teaching who have had same background or history, okay? History with the same guru, history with the same practice. Guruji, I'm sidetracking now. I guess I'm allowed. Um, <laughs> Guruji never gave any one of us a script. There's no script. The only script is the counting and the breathing, like the rhythm and the metronome of the practice. There wasn't a teacher training course that gave us words to use with other people. It was totally individual. And when he gave us his blessing to teach, it was because he believed we had enough experience in our practice that we could then pass it on. And if you look at how we all teach and the words we use to teach, they're very, very different. Okay, at the end of the day, the experience is the same, right? Somebody uses a lot of words, somebody just uses their body. Some, some of the times, you know your student, all you have to do is look at them, right? And something happens. So I think that this is an absolute blast to be hanging out with these guys and my peers and my big brothers to just watch how we're all working with people because we're all very different as you've seen. And I think it's, it's really fun. And there is a common intention. It's like, let's give our students good experience. Let's give our students experience that they can take with them, yeah, and not have to remember in a linear way or in a scholarly way any of this stuff, but you take with the experience, right? Once you've had an experience, it doesn't go away. <laughs> so that can be a helpful thing or a not helpful thing, right? We have five different places where the mind can be, the vrittis, the five different vritti places. One of them is called smriti vritti. You all know that one? Memory, okay? 
All right, the place where our mind goes when it's remembering. So often our mind can get kind of tricked into this game of remembering things that were not so pleasant, right? When we have some big trauma or drama or something that's hurtful that happens to us, it's like our mind wants to hold on to that, right? And it's like we relive it and we keep remembering and it's like the nightmare scenario. Well, fine, we had that experience, it is there. Is it helpful for us to keep going over and over and over in our mind? Maybe not, okay? Then we have these experiences, like what I had with Guruji so many times, this instant of aha, or connection, or something that happened. I can think of seven moments in time, okay, over the course of trips to India, where one instant, right, a microsecond of experience was worth the whole journey to India <laughs> and the whole months of practice and brutal traveling and all that stuff because I had that experience and I kept it with me. And recalling those experiences and using the smriti vritti, right, to recall those things, you know, we've all had it. We recall something and we get chills. Right? Something happens physiologically in our system when we have a memory. So if we can plug in the good stuff, and I've said to some of you um, as we were working, remember that, remember that, plug it in, plug it in, remember that. Because when you forget or you go away from that, there might be an opportunity to simply call it back. So, oh, oh, that's what that felt like. Oh, that's what it felt like when I was having this aha thing or when I, whatever it was. Right. So there's nothing wrong with having vrittis, okay? Vrittis will be there, right? Until we're liberated, the mind will be wiggling in some way or another, but appropriateness, right? How can we utilize our system and our mind appropriately so that it ends up actually being quite efficient and we don't have to beat ourselves up so much, right? So nothing that exists is evil. <laughs> in and of itself, right? You think, oh my God, there's so many horrible things happening on the planet, and it's depressing if you start like listing it all, right? But there's the karmic wheel that's turning. There's nothing evil about the tamasic energy of destruction and transformation, or the wiry energy of rajas. It's appropriateness. So we learn to call on what is appropriate, or even remember, or perhaps remind each other, right, of another way it can totally lighten the journey. You know, there's gonna be ups and downs, there's gonna be pain, there's gonna be stuff happening. It's inevitable, here we are on the planet in the Kali Yuga, stuff's gonna happen, but how do we deal? And if we can do that step back and look at, oh, this is a dance of energy. Look at how the energy is moving, right? Look how it's moving around me. Feel how it's moving in my system. Right? Having that capacity to observe rather than identify with, <laughs> um, again, can make it lighter. Right? And isn't that what we're all craving? Right? Sometimes we're craving something and we don't know what it is. <laughs> right? Or you have a, you go out and you have this beautiful meal and you eat a bunch of food and your stomach's full and it's like, yeah, but, yeah, but, <laughs> There's something not quite there, right? So um, all of these ingredients in the recipe can work together just like they do in Ayurveda and the six tastes in food. And we could have a whole week long workshop about Ayurvedic cooking and how all of that works to cultivate fullness, satiation, and vibrancy in our human beingness. Because here we are. <laughs> We're human beings, what to do with that? So we can play with it. We're trying to cultivate in our system the capacity for that sattvic energy to flow, okay? So that we can have that state of citta vritti nirodaha, all right? And that might not be all the time, right? Again, appropriateness, it's gonna play in time. What is appropriate for each time? Right? So to sit in meditation, to sit with a still mind, it's essential that the scale is tipped 
so that the sattvic energy is more. Okay. When we're out doing something else, it might not be that way. So it plays, yeah? I like to think of it as a, as a dance, a beautiful dance, right? Just like the nadis and the rivers, right? I can, I remember having a few experiences when I was practicing with Guruji, where I swear to God, I felt like there was hundreds of thousands of energies of river playing and dancing in my body. It was like the gods were dancing and having a party. And I was going along for the ride. And it was the lightest, most beautiful thing ever. It doesn't happen all the time. But <laughs> again, a glimpse, right? So when we have some sort of consistency in our practices, our various practices in our life, we start to get these glimpses. We get an aha here. And then some time goes by, and we don't get that aha. And then it happens again. Oh my God, there it is, right? And then there's this gap of time, and then it happens again. And then, after years of practice, you realize, oh, these glimpses are coming much closer together, right? And so it kind of establishes this norm until all of a sudden something that you only got glimpses of was one big glimpse, and it was happening all the time. Yeah, that, that state that we have when we've had an appropriate practice, an appropriate shavasana, right? We didn't overdo, we didn't underdo, we did like the just right thing. We come out of shavasana and we have kind of that, that really peaceful state. Right? Is it, y'all know what I'm talking about. I think you had it. <laughs> right? And then we go on with our life and something happens and we go out in traffic and then kind of that state kind of goes away. And then we can't wait to get back on our mat so we can get that state again the next day. And my personal experience with like this continual glimpse concept happened my first trip to Mysore. Uh, before that, I had a daily practice, but it wasn't always consistent in time because I was working, I was teaching, and you know how we have to juggle our schedules, and I didn't have the opportunity of being completely unemployed, and I had to do other things, right? So I had daily practice, but it wasn't totally consistent same time of day. And after spending three months every day, every morning with Guruji, after a couple of months, I realized that when I left the shala and went out into the traffic in India <laughs> and was riding my bicycle into KR Circle, that I was still kind of in that state, like it never went away. Right? And that was my first aha about consistency, part of the most practical and important part of abhyasa, okay, abhyasa, the practice part of practice, consistency. Then things start getting built in, and I had a new, new norm from which I was operating throughout the day. That was huge, right? So sometimes doing a trip or doing a retreat for a month or two months or three months or whatever it is, is enough to give us that glimpse so that we can then take it home with us. And maybe when we get back at home and we've got our kids and our jobs and you know, all the craziness, maybe our practice isn't gonna be quite uh, as consistent, right? But we have had that experience, right? And we can recall that and that experience starts to get built in. The question was about the nadis and do, do they stop at our body or do they extend out, right? So, there are 350,000 nadis. There's a lot. Some of them do indeed have their endpoints in certain places in our body. Okay? Some of them reach out beyond. This is my understanding. Right? Ask me to name those 350,000 nadis. No. <laughs> All right. But I believe there's a lot of energy going on. Right? And there are some very specific points where nadis do end. For example, at the tip of our nose, there are 24 nadi ending points. These are the nadis that have to do with creation and earth. All right. Just one example. Hello, nasagradrishti. <laughs> right? Nasagradrishti is pretty grounding, eh? Right? It's not like we're looking out and bringing our mind out here. When we practice Nasagradrishti, that 
is one of the reasons why that's the drishti. So there's a lot of rules and shmuels in the practice and look here and there and loop your toe and all of this. There are naughty ending points in our right and left big toe. How about our parangushtas? All right, there's a lot of attention that goes to that. All right, and that goes on with the different relationships. And yes, we do become more sensitive. Yeah. Which can be a double-edged sword. Yeah? Okay. Okay, any other questions? About, what did we talk about? We talked about gunas and yugas and nadis and yoga. Okay. We were talking about nadis and looking points. Okay, we look at the Ashtoangas. We haven't talked about the Ashtoangas too much, but um, perhaps you can begin to make a little more connection of how the specific techniques that we practice, okay, drishti, breath, bandhas, vinyasa, which I'll tie this all together in, in an hour, we'll actually do a little practice. Uh, but how that ties together with the nadis, with our sense organs, with the elements. Right? We learned from Premji the other day about the five elements that make up our body, right? that are associated with the five digits. right? Ether, air, fire, water, earth. Okay? Five are there. right? Our organs are there. Our nose is associated with which of those elements? Earth, right? And then you get the naughty points ending. They're just like, oh, yeah, Earth, right? Which of the chakras is associated with Earth? Muladhara chakra. Hello, Mulabandha. Yes, your nose tip is indeed connected to your anus, <laughs> right? There are connections there, right, that can actually help us, <laughs> all right, by adding these little details and, and practicing correctly, it's an enhancement to what, what else is going on, right? Through the techniques in the practice, we start to access, um, someone tell me what is the fifth of the eight limbs? Everyone say that with confidence. It's kind of assumed everyone knows the eight limbs. Okay, Pratyahara, what is that about? Sense withdrawal, okay? We have five senses. There are five elements. What's the first thing we start doing when we're breathing? We start listening. Ujjayi breath, right? Our sense of hearing starts to go inside. Right? And this whole pratyahara is not like a shutting down of the senses, right? It's an enhancement of the senses and developing the capacity for the sense organs to look internally, okay? It's not that they lose their capacity to look externally. In fact, their capacity to look externally is increased. You ever notice how, oh, I'm seeing better, I'm smelling better, I'm more sensitive to all of that. So as what we're doing out there becomes more sensitized, at the same time, we're learning to look inside, right? So, ujjayi breath makes us listen inside, okay? Nasagra drishti, all right? Our sense of sight, or whatever drishti, the prescribed drishti it is, our sense of sight starts going internally. Our sense of touch, right? We're feeling internally for the bandhas and the energy moves to a more subtle level. So, in this way, <clears throat> the very fundamental techniques of the practice, whether you're doing any fancy asanas or not, just those techniques start to take us in, cultivate pratyahara, and again, all of these eight limbs dance with each other, and as we develop a little bit more capacity in one, another comes along, and all of a sudden, it's like a really cool dance. I think. I think it's a cool thing. What a cool thing that we're even like all here doing this. I love it. Okay, any other questions about what we talked about already? Okay, so I had some questions <clears throat> about the accessory practices 
Um, does anyone want to ask those? Some of you, I said, ask that on Friday. Yes. About the oil bath. About the oil bath. Okay, what about that oil bath? <laughs> Do we fill a bathtub with oil? <laughs> that would be interesting. We could just fill a swimming pool and have a group oil bath. <laughs> All right, so oil bath, and, and some of you may be very familiar with this. Some of you might have not have heard that term before. And there's probably a few of you have heard that term and always wondered about that. You know, what's up with that? So oil, <coughs> particularly sesame oil, which is used in Ayurvedic medicine um, as an external application, right, has the capacity to reach internally and draw out. Castor oil also has that property and is sometimes prescribed for people to do a topical application. So this, this brings us into the whole inner outer world and you know, directions in, in which we go. But this topical, it's not like a skin enhancement. It's like, oh, I want to moisturize my skin, so I'm going to put on oil. Sesame oil is usually the base for Ayurvedic medicinal oil bath treatments and abhyanga, okay? Because it has that capacity to go in and span the seven datus, all right? There are other oils around that are nice to use and coconut oil and things like that that are nice and have a little bit of that capacity but like sesame oil is like the queen of that. Castor oil also has a capacity, but it's really intense. So if someone's doing an oil bath for the first time, I usually suggest they use sesame oil or a sesame castor oil mix. So it's not quite so heavy, right? You do too much castor oil, <laughs> um, you it can leave you feeling a little stoned. It's kind of like you do a cleanse or a fast. So the, the process to do that is you get some good sesame oil. You get some sort of a little vessel, right? I have this little squeeze bottle that I travel with that's about this big, right, that I take with me. And they have these nice kettles in the room here so I can boil water and put my sesame oil in the little container, put the little container in a little teacup, pour the boiling water in the teacup so the oil heats. Right? You wanna make sure that you are in a heated place um, not necessarily a sauna, but someplace where you're not going to catch a draft or a cold. At home in Colorado, I lock myself in my little bathroom <laughs> and I get in my bathtub and have an enclosed space. Heat up the oil. Make sure that you are, your skin is clean, so you take like a pre-oil bath bath or shower, so you don't have any sweat or lotion or anything on. And you self-apply the oil from head to toe. Okay, from the top to the bottom, right? Hair is optional. Does someone have a sesame oil? Sesame oil. Okay, sesame oil is generally appropriate for all constitutional types. It's a little bit heating. So if you are Miss Pitta in a really, really, really hot climate, you might cut that with castor oil. But in general, okay, that would be the basis. Right? So you apply, you rub it in, broad strokes. If you have special spots, you put more <laughs> right? and hang out. And it's like giving yourself a little self-massage. It's great. It's like, yeah, I'm going to take this 40 minutes of time for me, and I'm going to do this and lock the door and turn off the phone and chill. Right? You will feel it start to go in. You'll be amazed at how little is left after 20 or 30 minutes, it goes in, right? And then you follow that up with a hot shower or immerse in hot water, you know, wipe the rest off. You can use a little mild, little soap or something if you feel you need to. Usually just hot water is enough. Wipe off the residue and there you go, okay? Practically speaking, all right, helpful hints about oil baths is it's nice to have a sacrificial lungi, <laughs> okay? I have a sacrificial pair of socks in case I need to like get up and walk to the other room or something so I don't track oil all over my floors, right? <laughs> and a sacrificial lungi or some piece of cloth because it's, it is over time hard to get the oil out of the cloth and eventually you throw it out and you get another one. Did I answer your question? Okay, 
A, B, so, so everybody's in Colorado saying, Annie, that's the video you need to make. That's how you're going to make money. <laughs> make the oil bath video. <laughs> Yes, raw, raw, raw. Yeah, not toasted. Not toasted. <laughs> no, 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 it's unrefined and yeah. Yes? You can. Yeah, the sesame oil itself is heating. Right? Right. And that's an option if you want to, you know, want a bonus activity. Yeah, sweat it out, get in a steam bath or a sauna or something. Right. For starters, oil bath 101, just do that once a week. Yeah. You can experiment with the oils. You know, castor oil, sesame oil. If that feels too gloppy, you can put in a little coconut oil. I had a prescription going on one time for my Ayurvedic doctor that was sesame oil, castor oil, and ghee. And some magic herb. And I put it as like... I felt like, God, somebody's going to want to eat me. I smelled like food, you know. <laughs> you heat the oil, okay? Especially if you're using castor oil, you have to heat it or it's too thick and gloppy. You don't boil it, but if it's in a container in boiled water, you leave it in its little vessel and there you go. Okay, does that make sense? Oil bath 101. What else? I just wanted to add because you know, the comment I was taught that you, you do this when you wake up and then shower and then you practice. And, and that, that effect with the oil and then the practice has, has the effect of the it, it, You can do it that way, all right? You can do it after your practice, but never do it on a full stomach. Never on a full stomach. Okay, just like your asana practice, you wouldn't do on a full stomach. Right? You don't like eat a meal and then do an oil bath, right? So the ideal timings are kind of like our asana practice, like right before breakfast or right before dinner. Yeah, yeah, that's important. Yeah, so the question was about every morning, um, Philippa's been helping me and Radha's been helping me do the little puja and the little ceremony to the altar. Someone asked me the other day, God, you said something, what did that mean? What did I say? J Ma Mataki J. And I said, what did that mean? What is that about? And I said, ask me. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's a fair game question, <laughs> right? Because what does it have to do with? Like everything. Everything has to do with everything. It's always about everything. And it's about the elements. So often what we have going on in these ceremonies, um, almost always in all world traditions, there is fire involved, okay? Fire is the energy of transformation. Fire is the element that is associated with Shushum the Nadi, right? So again, think about all indigenous peoples. Ever since there was fire, fire has been involved in ritual, right? And I'm gonna do a little plug here uh, for a documentary that was filmed recently in Crestone. The name of the documentary is called The Flame. And it shows many different lineages and spiritual groups and their ritual and what happens with flame. So the elements come in, right? The first element that we do in a Pujan is the water, Jala. We're doing like a clearing and Pusha can be big, little, complicated, not complicated. How many rules are there, Manju? I mean, there's like doing a puja, you know, you hire a priest if you really want to do it right. And what we're doing here is like puja 101. And it's simply cultivating consistency and consciousness in what we do. It's an offering before we begin our practice. It's, it's like when we say the prayer at the beginning of the practice. We say a prayer of gratitude, then we begin, right? I do my little prayer and offering here, then do the prayer, <laughs> and then begin, right? So I won't go into great detail, but if you observe, the elements are there. The water is there, the fire is there, the wind is there, the mantras are there. And it's an offering first to the divine before we take. Right. So um, there are many other ingredients that are often offered 
right? After they are offered, then we might partake in them. Sometimes there's something called prasad, food that's offered, right? You would never take the prasad and then offer it to the gods. Everything happens here first, and then we take. So I, that wasn't a, a detailed answer, but another day, Pusha 102, right? But mostly it's building in that consciousness and, and building these things in consistently in our life of ha acting consciously. Take your shoes off before you come into the practice space. <laughs> Offer to the gods before you take something for yourself. And you build in these little bits. It often, it slows us down as well, all right? Bless the food, say a prayer before you start eating it. <laughs> yeah? Slowly, slowly, okay? Little bits slow us down enough that we're really acting in integrity and consciousness. What else? Okay, someone asked me, I was saying, I was repeating one of the names of the divine feminine, and I was saying J. We were taking pictures or doing something, and I said, J Ma Mataki J. Uh, who is anybody? Yeah. Okay, so you didn't ask the question, but I remembered. <laughs> okay, so what does that mean anyway? What does J mean? Yeah, do, do you all know? You don't know what J means. What does Ujjayi mean? Vic does not mean fire breath. It means victorious sound. So Jai, J. Okay, sometimes some J, Jai, same root. Okay victory. So you'll see at the end of class we're going to maybe do a little chanting if we have time and uh, one of the practices that we do is at the end of a chant we then repeat the name of the divinity that we've been praying to and we say Jay, okay? Jay Ganesha Bhagwanaki Jay. So this expression Jay is this victory. It's like putting the punctuation point on the end of the prayer and saying, yeah, it's like cheerleader for the gods. It's like, yeah, J Ma, that's who we've been, that's who we've been talking about, right? And there's many different names of the divine. Often when I say J Ma, Mataki J, or I just say the name Ma, right? That's, that's kind of big. It's not like Durga or Lakshmi or any particular name. This Ma energy or divine mother energy you can call it the Maha Shakti energy, is that energy which is beyond the influence of the gunas. So we opened up this discussion talking about the gunas on the energy of existence. Where does existence come from? Right? So the only thing, can't even say thing, Okay, that which is not under the influence of the play of the three energies is the Maha Shakti. It's the source divine creative energy that has no form, but is responsible for everything that does have form. Okay, it is not under the influence of the gunas, right? yet is responsible for the play of the gunas that goes on in creation. I think the word I said the other day was Mahamayaki. Okay, this would be this energy that looks after this play of energy in creation. So sometimes we talk in some circles about the divine mother, right? In <coughs> Crestone, there is a temple to Harakan Babaji and Harikandeshwari Ma, right? Okay, in the lineage of a temple that's in North India, right? Inside the temple, there's a statue, a murti, that's made of marble, right? Beautiful mother energy. Looks very sattvic, right? Some people, Indian people mistake, oh, Lakshmi temple. But it's the mother temple. So this is the energy that is behind Lakshmi and Saraswati and Durga and the rest, right? And that's what this image right here is. That's why this particular image is on this altar because I brought this piece of glass and wood and photo 
right, this chunk of material from Crestone. It's a picture of the marble that's in the temple. It's like there's a lot of material involved here, right? There is a marble statue. There's a picture of that. There's a photo. There's a frame. We're schlecking it around with us. But how else can I relate to this idea of formless, right, of that source energy that doesn't have form? So we've given it a form. Okay, the form represents the formless. Right? The other images represent some other aspect of the divine. Am I making sense? What was the question? Oh, it was the, the J thing, right? So, right, so J, right? This is Hadiakanda Shori Ma, right? This piece of material reminds me of the source of everything. This source energy, the divine mother energy, is also described in the Devi Bhagavatam. In this, should, we, should I tell a story? Is it story time? I'll tell a story. Okay, sorry, there's, okay. Audio obstacles. Okay. Okay, close your eyes. Here we go. Once upon a time, this won't be a long story, but a short story. <coughs> Once upon a time, some hundreds of thousands of years ago or so, and this is a story from the Devi Bhagavatam, which is one of the Puranas that was written in the last Yuga. And it's the storybook that tells about all the gods and goddesses and, and their fights and their salvations and their love affairs and all the little lilas and dramas through the gods. And there's a section in the book where the Divine Mother has just gifted the Himalaya mountain, Gauri, as his daughter. Okay? Gauri is another name for Parvati, okay? the <coughs> consort of Shiva. So you got to wrap your mind. It's like we're in storyland now, okay? The mountain. The mountain actually has a voice and a personality. This is the Himalaya mountain. And he's just been gifted Gori, as his daughter. And he is absolutely awestruck. It's like, wow, what a gift is this, right? And he's like having a conversation with the divine energy, the source of all creation. He's so wonderstruck. He wants to express his gratitude, but he wants to also understand what's going on. So he asks the Divine Mother two questions. The first question is, who are you? Can you describe yourself to me? I want to understand you. And the answer was from the Divine Mother, I am the eternal truth. I am the source of all beings, and I enter into the human beings as the life breath called prana. So there's a definite association being made with this mother source energy and prana. The second question, the mountain asked the mother, so this is so awesome. But how can I understand you more, how you've told me but how can I actually have the experience and know you? This is a punchline. The answer is, <laughs> O king of the mountains, practice Ashtanga yoga in all of its eight limbs and you will know me. And then the book goes into a whole talk about the, each of the eight limbs of yoga at the end. There's this conversation from the Divine Mother saying, yes, and you practice Mula Bandha, and you practice the Pranayama, you practice the eight limbs. And the chapter ends with the Divine Mother giving the mountain the instructions to always practice with a guru. Don't practice this from the books. You go, you find a guru who knows the eight limbs, you learn, and you practice, and you will indeed know me. Okay. The end. And that was like the end of this chapter. So <clears throat> for me, on a personal level, coming to this chapter in the book was really huge because it's like, oh my God, there's all this other stuff that's like so out there, 
right? You had to like really go into twilight zone to get into these stories. It's like, well, there, well, there it is. There's the eight limbs again, and it wasn't coming from something that Guruji made up or Krishnamacharya made up or anybody in the last few thousand years made up. This stuff's been around a long time. So there's a story of the day, um, and hence the images and, and so on. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So, I enter into the human beings as the life breath called prana. So, that's kind of big, yeah? Prana is like this divine energy that we have access to. And we've talked the last few days about how the breath is the vehicle for the prana. Yes? Do we agree? Is that a, a good way to put it? All right, so breath is not prana. Prana is not breath, but the prana rides the breath. And it's through the breathing we can access the prana. It's through the breathing that we can access mulabandha as well, which we'll explore in a little bit here. Right? So we have this idea of vehicle. There's a vehicle. There's a conveyance of how we get from point A to point B. How do we get to that prana? It's through the breath, right? In the same way, in the oil bath world, in Ayurveda, <coughs> sesame oil is a great uh, vehicle, right, to span the different levels and layers of our being. It goes in from the outside, it goes in, and it draws out, right? This inner, outer drawing and the capacity to span levels. Then, if we get into the food world, right, there are certain foods that have the capacity to also span the datus, right? So if, if sesame oil would be the vehicle that we apply externally, what would be the substance that we would consume that might span internally in Ayurveda? Ghee. Ghee! <laughs> Jay! <laughs> All right, so... Ghee, and, and you know, it's, it's hard sometimes to wrap our mind around, and, oh, anti-dairy, anti-this, anti-that, I'm vegan, I'm this, I'm that, we got so many different practices going on, I'm raw food, whatever. Okay, whatever is appropriate, but the quality of ghee is that it does indeed go in, not to just our digestive system, but it spans the levels and the layers. Again, is used in Ayurvedic medicine um, in various ways as something that we take internally. Right. So those are just examples of like vehicle. What, do, what, do we, what is the conveyance? How do we get from out here to in here and from in here to out there? And how do we span these opposites and all the little levels and layers of our being, right? We've got our gross, we know that there are seven components to the body, right? And it, it's such a wide range from the most gross level of our bones and our blood and our flesh, right? All the way down to the most subtle level of the nadis, right, which you can't really put your finger on, right, and then there's layers in between, like our nervous system and our organs and our plasma. It's like, a, it's kind of a complex thing, right? So no wonder we don't always have it figured out, right? But again, having the little bit of theory or background behind how the energy is flowing can often be helpful, right? or it might be confusing. Right? Or maybe today you're kind of taking this in and, or not, and it's kind of going, eh, whatever, all those words. Right? And you come back two years from now, and somebody talks about the same stuff, and all of a sudden it's more interesting. <laughs> right? Or you're taking it in, and a few years go by, and it's like, oh, it's even more interesting. Yeah, it doesn't get boring. It's like these principles that I'm speaking about are pretty fundamental yogic principles. You go to some other school or some other tradition or some other teacher, they're not going to be different, right? Nobody's going to change the eight limbs or tell you that the three gunas are something else, right? It's going to be the same. And so you get like this basic form, and the more time goes on, you start to take in more of the subtleties and have a few more experiences, right? And it gives us something to relate to. Capacity to also span the datus, right? So if if sesame oil would be the vehicle that we apply externally, what would be 
the substance that we would consume that might span internally in Ayurveda? Ghee. Ghee! <laughs> Jay! <laughs> All right, so ghee, and, and you know, it's, it's hard sometimes to wrap our mind around, sometimes, oh, anti-dairy, anti-this, anti-that, I'm vegan, I'm this, I'm that, we got so many different practices going on, I'm raw food, whatever. Okay, whatever is appropriate, but the quality of ghee is that it does indeed go in not to just our digestive system, but it spans the levels and the layers. Again, is used in Ayurvedic medicine um, in various ways as something that we take internally. All right, so those are just examples of like vehicle. What, do, what, do we, what is the conveyance? How do we get from out here to in here and from in here to out there? And how do we span these opposites and all the little levels and layers of our being? Right? We've got a gross, we know that there are seven components to the body, right? And it, it's such a wide range from the most gross level of our bones and our blood and our flesh, right? All the way down to the most subtle level of the nadis, right? Which you can't really put your finger on, right? And then there's layers in between, like our nervous system and our organs and our plasma. It's like... A, it's kind of a complex thing, right? So no wonder we don't always have it figured out, right? But again, having the little bit of theory or background behind how the energy is flowing can often be helpful. Right? Or it might be confusing, right? Or maybe today you're kind of taking this in and, or not, and it's kind of going, eh, whatever, all those words, right? And you come back two years from now and somebody talks about the same stuff. And all of a sudden, it's more interesting, <laughs> right? Or you're taking it in, and a few years go by, and it's like, oh, it's even more interesting. Yeah, it doesn't get boring. It's like these principles that I'm speaking about are pretty fundamental yogic principles. You go to some other school or some other tradition or some other teacher, they're not going to be different, right? Nobody's going to change the eight limbs or tell you that the three gunas are something else. Right? It's going to be the same. And so you get like this basic form, and the more time goes on, you start to take in more of the subtleties and have a few more experiences, right? and it gives us something to relate to.